education and we worked on this webinar with the Citizen Lake Monitoring Program, Water Action Volunteers, um, Wisconsin DNR and the First Detector Network. Whoa. Sorry, my slides are stuck. Uh, just an overview of what we're all going to cover during this webinar. Um, just a pretty quick introduction um, to welcome you all. And then we're going to go over the different species groups we'll have. And each presentation will be 20 to 25 minutes. Um, we're going to first cover submerged aquatic plants and then go over the aquatic and wetland animals that we should keep a lookout for. Uh, riparian plants and upland wetland plants that you might see when you're um, along lake streams or wetlands. And then we'll have a, a question and answer period. So the species that we're gonna review are all species that are identified, almost all of the species that are identified in um, NR40 chapter. NR40 is our invasive species identification, classification, and control rule. So this is species that we've identified as issues when the, within the state we've um, said that they're invasive and we want to be able to keep a lookout for them. So we selected target species from within NR40 that we'll see when we're out in lake streams or wetlands. Um, so you can go to our NR40 website to learn more about the species that we identified and regulate. For each of the species that we're going to cover, we're going to go over just key identification characteristics. So certain things about each species that you need to look at to be confident in your ID for them. And then we'll talk about um, just the different parts of these plants or animals. Then we're gonna all share phenology information that was put together the, by the Wisconsin First Detector Network. And you'll see in these slides, we'll have the list of the species and just to show you the symbology so each presenter doesn't have to go through it. Um, there's going to be different colors for the life stage that you'll see at the time of year. Um, we'll also have symbology for detectability. If it's a hollow circle, it's not detectable during that time of year. If you only see a quarter circle, it's low, half is medium and full is high. Um, and like I said, that can be found at the First Detector Network and we'll provide that uh, a link to where you can see more information later in the PowerPoint. We'll also share distribution maps for each species and there'll be small uh, screen clips of this map that you see in the state of Wisconsin. For the most part, we're pulling our maps from the lakes and AIS mapping tool that's available on the DNR website. And it's tied to all the data that we have in the surface water integrated monitoring system, which is where we put, enter all of our data for monitoring efforts for aquatic invasive species. Um, where you see the green check, it means it's a verified urease water mole foil. And then some of these are, are just lines if it's along a section of stream where it's found. And, um, if we have a, a hash mark, that's going to be a polygon. Um, so they're, they're not all going to be big like this with the big check marks. They'll be a little harder to see. You can see this Vila Sonida County. Um, so not all the maps are going to be totally visible in the PowerPoint, um, but you'll be able to access them through our mapping tool. Um, and that's all I had for, for the intro, but we're going to start off with Paul on the submersed aquatic plants. So Paul, I'll stop sharing my slides and then you can take over. Hello everyone. I'll be taking uh, care of the first part of the webinar today on submergent and floating plants and we'll start to transition to submergent animals and then move our way up the shoreline and conclude with more upland species. So I will start things off with the phenology chart that Maureen just mentioned. So again, this is available on the Wisconsin First Detector Network website and it shows uh, the best time to be looking for any of these species and shows different uh, times that you can see different characteristics within each species. So I'll be talking about each one of these in this order today. First one being Carolina fanwort. This is a species that we do not yet have in Wisconsin. It is a prohibited species under NR40. It's been found in Michigan before. Uh, it is actually well established in a couple chains of lakes in lower Michigan. And it looks very similar to our native water marigold and a few other native aquatic plants that have these highly dissected leaves. This one is uh, identified best by looking at one 
cross section of the stem where you can see the leaves are opposite, meaning that there are two at any given point on the stem. And they're separated by a fairly long stalk, fairly long being maybe three quarters of an inch. So it's not really long, but in the picture there, at, right at the top, you can see that that, uh, that pair of leaves are well separated apart from each other. And then on the bottom, they have a flower that is just above the, sur the surface of the water. It's white with six petals. And next to it might be just a couple of tiny floating leaves. If you look just to the, the upper right of the flower there, you can see this tiny little uh, kind of sword shaped green floating leaf. They're very small. And it just serves to add a little bit of buoyancy to hold that flower up. So as I mentioned, we don't have any populations known in Wisconsin. It is a species that's been used in the aquarium trade and water garden trade fairly extensively. Um, not so much anymore, but it's certainly possible that it, it could be here already at this point and has gone undetected or could be introduced at some point. So it's good to keep an eye out for it. It does look similar to the water marigold here. Water marigold is a mostly soft water species in Wisconsin. Uh, so typically the, the northern half of the state or so is more commonly uh, has more lakes that, that would commonly have water marigold in it. It is our only aquatic aster. So it does have a fairly large aster type flower that is stuck out of the water a few inches. And the way to tell this apart from fanwort, not only by the flower itself, but also by looking at the leaves there around the stem, they are not separated apart by that long stalk. So it's really one of these examples where you, you have to look kind of closely at the leaf arrangement to see um, which species it is. All right, moving on from that one, Brazilian waterweed is another prohibited species. It has been found once in Wisconsin in Portage County in 2009, and it was quickly eradicated. It was in a private pond uh, and hit with a couple of herbicide treatments in order to remove it. Um, if you're familiar with common waterweed or elodia, it is a very common species uh, of native plant in Wisconsin in lakes and streams and wetlands and all kinds of aquatic habitats. This is related and it looks kind of similar except it's way bigger. So you can see the nickel in the photographs there. It's commonly the, the diameter of at least a quarter, um, sometimes twice that. So it can be a very large plant compared to the natives that it looks kind of like. So we're looking for leaves that are in a whirl or a ring around the stem of at least four and the leaves are serrated on the edge. So if you looked at with even just a tiny bit of magnification, you'd see a lot of very sharp teeth along the edges of the leaves. And as I said, we don't have any populations currently existing in Wisconsin as far as we know, but it's another one that is very commonly seen in the aquarium trade or was and is not quite as commonly seen anymore. And similar to that is another species that it's also related to called hydrilla. This is one that has been causing problems in the southern United States for decades, but is uh, a recent discovery in northern Illinois. So it's not very far away. It's also in Indiana, lower Michigan. So uh, it's not far from here. And it's another one with these whirls of leaves of at least four. You can see a, a ring or a whirl of five there with the serrated edges again. And in the in the sediments just below the plant, just an inch or two into the sediments, you'll find these tubers. And it's basically like a tiny potato. It's a starch reserve that creates a new plant from the energy stored within that structure. Um, none of our native species that look similar to this will produce any tubers. So that's one of the definitive things you can look for. If you do find a tuber on a plant that looks like this, it is hydrilla. The flowers on really all of the plants within this, this group are quite rare and they're very delicate. So any kind of chop on the water from waves or props or fish swinging, uh, swimming by or anything can often break those flowers off. So they're not often seen because they're so easily broken. We did have one population in 2009 in Marinette County that was treated and was removed. So as far as we know, we do not currently have any hydrilla in Wisconsin. Now this is the native that I mentioned, the common waterweed or elodia or elodia, very common species. There's another one that's related to this that's also native, uh, somewhat less common northerly species. But this one tends to have a 
a whorl of three leaves that are not serrated. If you look under really heavy magnification, you can sometimes see a couple of teeth on there, but um, those other two species, Brazilian waterweed and hydrilla, have teeth that are large enough that you can see them usually without any magnification. And this tends to have this whorl of, of quite smooth, um, three quite smooth leaves. They are not serrated on the edges. They're also not serrated underneath, which hydrilla is. Under the, the line that runs down the middle of each leaf is called the mid vein. And underneath that, there would be a bunch of spines on that as well if it was hydrilla. I see a question in the chat about the plants spreading by seed or rhizomes. Um, none of them produce rhizomes, but they produce very effectively by fragmentation. So the plants can lay down and create new offshoots from uh, any part of the stem that touches the sediment. And in this photograph here, right under the nickel, you can see one of these adventitious roots coming off of the stem where the stem itself is producing new roots that could uh, could take hold and then create a new plant from there. And as far as seed goes, they, they do not spread very effectively by seed. It's mostly fragmentation. Okay, so moving on to a floating one. Um, this is a species that is, again, very common in the water garden trade or was. It is now um, illegal to sell. And um, it's a floating plant that was sold for, it was often called an algae buster. Um, the idea was that it would cover the surface of the water and block sunlight from reaching algae underneath. So it was effective at killing the algae or preventing algae growth because the algae wasn't seeing any sun. It also has large fibrous roots underneath and the idea there, um, when, when you would as far as marketing goes, was that these plants would suck a lot of nutrients out of the water and also compete with the algae for a nutrient source, thereby further reducing the, the likelihood of an algae problem in the pond. So it forms these large floating clusters. Each leaf has a swollen base. It's full of these very large uh, airy cells that are very buoyant. And so it holds that cluster well up into the, uh, on top of the water. It has a lot of buoyancy. Each leaf then has this large uh, sort of sail on top. It's very glossy and very tough. And the, the wind will catch those sails, if you will, and it'll break the clumps into smaller clumps, which then float around and move populations to different parts of a water body. The bottom, photo there is the flower spike that this one creates. It's a very attractive flower, which is another reason why it was commonly sold in the water garden trade. It has five petals with the top one with this interesting uh, blue and, and uh, green or, or yellow spot on the top. And underneath, as I said, long purplish roots sometimes can be a couple feet long and they just dangle down and feed the plant by grabbing nutrients right from the water column. We typically see this one a few times a year. Uh, it's just the result of water garden dumps, we think. So uh, every year, oh, for the last four years, I believe, in Lake Winnicani, uh, west of Lake Winnebago, we found populations there. We found them in the, uh, in the uh, Mississippi River in Pool 5. We've seen them in a couple of other scattered locations across the state. Again, it seems that people are just dumping them in some easy access point to any water body. And whether they can survive the winter is a big question. This is a, really a zone nine or zone 10 plant. It's really a subtropical type species. So there's a lot of debate whether this species actually could withstand a Wisconsin winter, but we err on the side of caution and just try to remove it just in case it would be able to survive the winter here. Uh, Chris in the chat asked where the Price County location was. That was in Fifield. I believe it was at a wastewater treatment plant or just downstream from one. So the water was artificially warm and uh, I'm pretty sure that's, that's where it was. And yeah, Amanda just put in Green Bay also. It was found in, in Green Bay recently. Okay, so the only thing that would likely be confused with water hyacinth that is a native species is our wild calla lily. This is a common species in bogs and soft water lakes where 
Um, a lot of organic material and sphagnum bogs are adjacent to the lake or a river. Um, it does have these large leaves that stick up that are sort of the same shape and color as a water hyacinth. The flower is very different as you can see here. Uh, if you're familiar with skunk cabbage or uh, Jack in the pulpit or something like that, it's in the same family as those plants. It has a fairly boring looking uh, flower spike with this, this white hood around it. Very different than the very showy uh, spike that the water hyacinth uh, uh, creates or produces. And the leaves on wild calla are produced from a creeping stem. So it just slowly creeps out over the water. It floats and sends up one individual leaf at a time, a few inches apart from each other. Water hyacinth is a floating cluster of plants or a cluster of leaves where many, many leaves are produced from one single point at the, the crown of this floating plant. So a little bit different growth habit to it as well. Okay, European frogbit is one that we have not found here in Wisconsin yet. It's in the Eastern Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I believe it's been found in the Detroit area also, so Eastern Lower Michigan. And it's more of a problem east of there. It looks like a bunch of tiny lily pads. The pads only get to a few inches across, so quite small compared to uh, our native water lilies here. And the flower is also quite small, about the size of a quarter, and has three large white round petals with a yellow center. Each of the plants, somewhat like water hyacinth, uh, creates this floating cluster of leaves that spreads by what's called stolons. And the stolons are little creeping stems that uh, are sent out in, in multiple directions and can create little plants called daughter plants just uh, juveniles that are produced by a, a mother plant. And in this case, and in the case of water hyacinth as well, it can spread these stolons in four directions at the same time. So one parent plant can send out four stolons, basically 90 degrees from each other and create additional plants. So eventually any of these floating cluster forming plants can form a pretty solid mat of vegetation where they're all connected to each other and it moves around as one large mass. On the bottom, you can see that the underside of one of these frog bit leaves, it's very inflated at the base. You can see those very large cells near the stem attachment point, and those provide a lot of buoyancy to the plant to keep it on the surface. So again, we don't have any here in Wisconsin as far as we know. One possible native species you may confuse it with is water shield. But water shield does not have any notch in the leaves. It's just a little football shape. And all of our native water lilies would have notches and also the frog bit. I'll go back to that. You can see there is a, a little notch there in that heart shaped leaf. Water shield does not have that. It's also got a very slimy coating on the stem and the undersides of the leaves, which you can see in the lower photo there, especially as the new, uh, new leaves or new flower stalks are forming and has these very very slimy coatings on the new tissue. Parrot feather is another prohibited species that we have found a couple of times in Wisconsin. It has a submergent form that looks very much like any other milfoil. It's in the milfoil genus, Myriophyllum. And it has a, a very large emergent portion as well. And what you can see in the lower photo is the submergent leaves and then you can see it popped out of the water and created a very different looking emergent portion. So that is the same plant, but it's got a very different form in order to adapt to an area where it's not supported by water and it can dry out because it's in the open air. So the leaves are very much reduced. It's a slightly different color even. Um, and it's really just an adaptation for being out in the open air instead of being in the water surrounded by moisture all the time. In the top photo, you can see the little flowers that are formed at the base of each leaf. So that's called the leaf axle, where a leaf is meeting the stem. That's where all the flowers are produced on this species. And we found this a couple of times, Mississippi River Pool 5, that was back in 2013, I think. And also in Dane County, it's been found as well. So 
Uh, it's popped up a couple of times. It's another very popular water garden species, so it's certainly possible that we may find it again in the future. It looks similar to this other invasive. This is a, a common restricted species, not prohibited, so it's a lower classification than NR40. And this is one that we have uh, fairly common. That, uh, that second bullet is, is out of date. We're at about 890, I believe, right now across the state. So it's fairly well, well distributed across the state. Um, it is another member of this, this milfoil genus, which parrot feather is in. They all have these very feathery leaves, typically in whorls of four. There is one milfoil that I'll just say, so nobody corrects me, there is one that doesn't have feathery leaves, but uh, it's a native species and we'll, we'll leave it at that because it's a fairly rare species anyway. Um, so all the other ones have these feathery leaves and what you're looking for on a Eurasian milfoil is that the leaf is in a whirl of four or sometimes more and each leaf is divided into at least 12 pairs of leaflets. So if you take one individual leaf and count the number of leaf divisions along one side, you'll get at least 12. And there it is. So this is what it tends to look like. If you take a cross section of the stem, you'd find four leaves attached in a ring or a whorl around that stem, each one of them having at least 12 uh, leaflets on each side of the leaf. So there's one single leaf. You can either count uh, all the way through or just count along one side and get at least 12. And this is one of the common fragmentation uh, species. It, it likes to spread by fragments. It doesn't spread a lot by seed. Um, it can reproduce sexually through flowers and seed, but it mostly relies on fragmentation to move itself around. And what you see here are the adventitious roots that are developing out of the stem from these fragments that are floating around. Whenever those fragments would reach any kind of sediment, whether they sink, or float into shallow water and then start to contact the sediment, the roots can go into the sediment and start a new plant from that little piece. Here it is growing next to our most common native species of water milfoil, the northern water milfoil. Two things that set this one apart fairly obviously is the color. The Eurasian milfoil tends to be pretty red at the top in the summertime and northern milfoil tends to be very green. You can see that the, the Eurasian on the right is growing to the surface a lot faster and branching much more heavily. Northern milfoil often is just a single column in the water and uh, is slower to reach the surface. And the other difference is shown at the bottom of the screen there, where you can see the number of times the leaflet div or the leaf divides into leaflets is much fewer as well. So you tend to see uh, four to eight or so uh, pairs of leaflets on a northern water milfoil leaf, whereas the Eurasian milfoil tends to have that, that 12 or more number. All right, brittle naiad is a prohibited annual. Most of our aquatic plants are not annuals, they are perennials, but the naiads are annuals. The brittle naiad is uh, our only prohibited invasive species of naiad. We have several native species as well. And this is entirely submergent. There are no floating leaves. There are no emergent leaves. The flowers are all below water. So everything about this one is completely under the water. The leaves tend to curve downward uh, and it's a very brittle plant, which is suggested by the common name of this species. Most of the time what you'll find is these little heads of the plant where the leaves are clustered together at the top of each branch, those are often floating around on their own because the plant is just so brittle that those heads tend to break off commonly. And within the leaf axles, you can see a couple, I think you can see my cursor here. So right here, there's a seed in the, the junction of these two branches here. There's another one down here, another one here. So as these little heads break off, they often have a couple of seeds within the leaf axles of, the, of each head, and they will fragment and get carried away on a, another plant that floats by or a piece of driftwood or it could be anything. Um, and that's a way for it to spread itself around locally throughout one ecosystem, uh, potentially moving from one body of water to the next also. 
the leaves are slightly serrated. Uh, if, if your eyes are good, you can see them without any magnification, but uh, typically with a 10X hand lens or even less, it's pretty easy to see the teeth along the margins of the leaves of brittle naiad. And you can also see the curving shape that's common in this species. So here's the distribution of that one. We do have um, seven populations here known. So it's, it's not common by any means in the state, but it's uh, scattered across the southern half or so of the state. And we have other species that can be mistaken for brittle naiad. The slender naiad is a native species, and this is a very common one. The leaves tend to be straight. They don't really curve much. They do have teeth around the sides, but they're not evident without a lot of magnification. Um, and it tends to be this very bright green color. And it's not brittle. The spiny naiad is one that is considered an introduced species here, but naturalized. So it's not a native species, but also not one that tends to cause any real major problems either. So it's not really managed, uh, not considered a major nuisance really. And that one has very obvious teeth. Uh, they're very large, very easy to see without any magnification. And it also has spines on the stem itself, which brittle naiad does not have. So if you see any spines on the stem, you can see in this upper right photo, just to the right of the nickel, there's some spines there on the stem. That would give it away as spiny naiad. That's a species that's pretty much just in the southeastern part of the state. It's occasionally popping up in other parts of the state or, or uh, can be found in those areas, but really mostly in very hard alkaline lakes of the, the southeast part of the state. And I put these two different photos of spiny naiad in there because there are these two different forms. So the top one has a very wide leaf. The bottom one has a very narrow leaf that can look kind of like the brittle naiad does um, with that very narrow leaf. But again, the teeth are very obvious and you'd be able to see the, the spines on the stem as well as the leaves. Okay, starry stonewort. This is a fairly new one to Wisconsin. It was first found in September of 2014 in Little Muskego Lake in Waukesha County and has since been found in additional locations in the state. This is actually a very large type of algae, um, not what you'd normally think of when you think of algae because this is in a different group that is much different and much more complex than a simple free-floating algae species or uh, filamentous algae or something like that. So these can grow up to six or seven feet tall. They have a central stem that makes them look like a plant. And if you're familiar with Cara or Nitella, those are common species or common uh, genera or groups of species in the same family. And they tend to have this central stem with these, these leaf-like structures that come out. So again, it looks very much like a plant. If you uh, get technical with these species, the, the stem is called the central axis or the main axis, and the leaves are actually called branchlets. So you'll see in the first bullet, I have leaves slash branchlets. Branchlet is really the, the correct term, but you can just consider them leaves and that's totally fine. But uh, just be aware that that really means the same thing in uh, this case. So those leaves or branchlets are in whorls again, typically a ring of five or six around the stem. And the whole plant is very smooth and bright green. And the lower, or sorry, the upper branchlets on the plant often have these bract cells that stick out. So it looks like the branchlet is actually forking. This is the branchlet here. And these narrower things that pop out of this uh, out of the branchlet are called bracts and those form where the reproductive structures end up forming on the plant. So it has this asymmetrical branching uh, forking type pattern at the end where these bract cells pop out and the, bra the branchlet is longer than the bract cells and that's really what the the important thing to look for. Um, if that's difficult to look for the much easier thing to look for is the presence of these little white stars in the sediments. That's where the, the starry stonework gets its name from. These are like little tubers. Again, it's a starch reserve for the plant to store excess energy and create a clone of itself sometime later in the future. So it produces these little stars that are 
uh, typically five to eight millimeters across. So that's not a large structure at all. If it's sitting on your finger, you can certainly see it, um, but it's not really big. Um, and they tend to have these, these kind of inflated lobes on them. It looks like a star with typically six points on it. Sometimes it has more than that. And they're produced an inch or two into the sediment on these little clear threads that look like monofilament fishing line. If you pull this up at any time of the year, it tends to have some of these, these stars or ball bills, they're called, hanging on to those threads. So it, it tends to be a very easy characteristic to look for. So here's the distribution in Wisconsin. We've got about 20 locations here, including, unfortunately, Green Bay, Sturgeon Bay, and Lake Michigan in Door County. So it is in some very large water bodies, which makes it really difficult to try to manage. Um, the rest of the sites have been managed in different ways because we're still trying to learn how to best deal with this species. Um, other states have been dealing with it for longer and haven't had a whole lot of success in controlling it in any kind of long-term sense. So we're trying to figure out what the best approach is. All right, one of the native species that looks similar is one of the species of Nitella that I mentioned before, the slender stonewort. This is a group of many native species. And again, these are, these are actually species of algae that are just very complex uh, groups here, group, uh, complex species of algae. And these ones are also delicate and very smooth and green. Um, although they are far more delicate than a starry stonewort. They tend to just collapse when you pull them out of the water. Starry stonewort actually holds its shape quite well when you take it out of the water. So that's one way to separate these two. You would not find any of those ball bills produced in the sediments, those little stars. And the branchlets tend to have a, a pretty symmetric um, forking at the end. So every time you see a branchlet, uh, there tends to be this fork at the end where the, the two parts are roughly equal. And even where there aren't reproductive structures further down the plant, you'll still find this forking because it, it occurs pretty much on the entire plant. Yellow floating heart is another small lily pad-like plant. Um, it is another water garden escapee or a release um, from water gardens. Pads are similar to frog bit and then they get maybe three to four inches across or occasionally a little bit larger than that, but fairly small compared to our native water lilies. It does have that notch in the leaf, but the leaves tend to have this scalloped edge and that's different than what you'd see on any of our water lilies around here. So that could be a clue if you just see a leaf and it happens to have this very scalloped edge, then that's a clue that it could be yellow floating heart. This one's been found just a few times in Wisconsin and has been eradicated in, in I think all but one of them at this point. So the flowers are produced above the surface. They have a fringed edge on the, uh, the edge of each petal and they're held about three or four inches above the water. The seeds are, they kind of look like little ticks. They've got all these long um, projections that are um, like little silica tubes that, that pop out of the side of the plant and it aids in the buoyancy of the seed and mm -hmm. also allows it to stick better to things so it could stick to other plants or um, possibly to an animal or something like that. And this one spreads very effectively by rhizomes that are really well anchored in the sediment so it's very difficult to get this stuff out. If you pull it by hand you really have to get into the sediment and gently work those rhizomes out of the sediments. If you just use a rake or something to just grab it from the top and yank on it, it'll break the leaves off and the rhizomes will remain intact and just sprout new leaves. So it's not a real great option to use a rake. There was a population in Forest County that was removed entirely by hand by just a couple of people um, that spent maybe, oh, I don't know, Chris can correct me, but I'm thinking maybe 10 or 12 hours total um, with two people to remove that population over, the, over a couple year period to, to monitor for new sprouting. So it's an effective method for sure. And here you can see known distribution. The Forest County population is not showing up on here, um, but it was reported in Forest County as well and, and removed. 
All right, water lettuce is another floating plant that also spreads by those stolons that I mentioned before. You can sort of see the stolon pattern in this photo here on the top where the largest plant in the center of the photo is the mother plant. And you can even see the lines underwater where those stolons are. That's the stolon reaching over to this little daughter plant over here on the right. There's another one going to the lower left, producing another plant there one going straight left and one going up. So they produce these large mats of water lettuce floating on the surface. It also has these large roots that form underneath and dangle down into the water, much like the water hyacinth does and frog bit also for that matter. Um, so it pulls nutrients directly out of the water column. And this plant is a very unique looking plant. There's really nothing else that looks like it it's very, very soft and very lightweight. The leaves are pretty much just air. Um, very squishy, fuzzy, soft leaf. And it looks a lot like just a head of lettuce or a head of cabbage floating on the water. So that's where the name comes from. The flowers are extremely inconspicuous. They're produced in the center of each cluster at the base of a leaf. Uh, very, very tiny flower, a matter of millimeters across. So it's not likely something that you'd ever even notice. And we found this one a few times as well, since it is a common water garden species or was, uh, it's, it seemed to be often just dumped into local ditches and rivers and lakes where it was a convenient point to just dump some plants at the end of the season. All right, curly leaf pondweed is a, a common species around here. Um, not as common as you get into the northern part of the state, but quite common in the central and southern part. It can grow in streams and lakes and wetlands. It's not very picky about where it grows. Uh, we think it probably arrived through ballast water when uh, ships are, are dumping ballast water from other parts of the world into our ports here. Uh, it was sold as an aquarium plant for a while, and it may also have been introduced when common carp were stocked from Europe in the 1800s. It's a plant with a sort of backwards life cycle in that it grows from October through June. And uh, so that means it's gone for most of the summer unless the water is very cool. It, it doesn't like warm water. So when the water reaches a certain temperature in the summer, it just dies back and uh, is gone until the fall. It does release nutrients when it dies into the water column. So those nutrients then feed algae blooms and it can cause water quality issues when it dies back. So this is a plant that has uh, a serrated leaf. Um, it is our only pondweed that has a serrated edge on the leaf. And I think I have a picture coming up where you can see that much better. Um, it does have rhizomes and what's called a turion. The turion is a little um, condensed structure on the branch where many leaves are, are pulled together and the stem is very dense and hard. And it's a place where the, the plant is storing extra starch material for uh, a clone of the parent plant to form later on. In this case, since this plant has a different kind of life cycle, it is dormant through the summer and it sprouts a new plant in the fall and grows through the winter and the spring of the following year. And again, that, sorry about that bullet being outdated. It's a, we're, uh, we've added about 20, locations there. So we're at 930 or 40 or so documented populations in the state. So here you can see that serrated leaf, very large teeth or very obvious teeth when it's magnified a little bit. And the leaf tip tends to be quite dull. We have about three dozen species of pondweeds here in the Midwest. And this is the only one that is not native here. All the other ones are beneficial native species. This is the only one that is non-native. It's also the only one that has a serrated edge. So if you see a pondweed with a serrated edge, then you know it's curly leaf. It also has three veins that run through the leaf in most cases. Sometimes it's up to five, but it'll never be more than that. And you can see those three veins here running from the base of the leaf to the tip. Identifying pondweeds can be kind of tricky. And one of the ways to identify them to species is looking at the number of veins that run through a leaf. So here you have three to five, and any other species that looks similar to this would have way more than five veins running through it. 
So here's a distribution map basically showing that it's uh, pretty common in the southern part of the state, not as common in the north. And here's two pondweed species that are natives that sometimes are sent to me uh, through pictures or specimens. Um, uh, people are thinking they're curly leaf, but uh, they're not. One thing you'd be able to look for immediately is whether the tip is round or sharp. Both of these species have sharp pointed leaves. They both have way more than five veins in them and neither of them have serrated edges. So any of those things would help to distinguish curly leaf from a native pondweed. All right, and the last one is water chestnut. This is not one that's really anywhere near here yet. It's um, it's really in New York, Pennsylvania, um, eastern or southeastern Ontario, um, really that area of the country, not around here at this point. Um, that's me in New York in 2013, I think. Um, that's in northern New York near Lake Ontario where water chestnut is somewhat common. And you can see those very large floating rosettes of leaves that it forms out there with these long dangling stems that hang down underneath. So it has these waxy floating leaves that are sort of triangular with a very serrated edge and uh, these long stems hanging down. The fruits are, I, I meant to throw a picture of the fruit in here, so sorry about that. It's got a very hard spiny fruit that's a couple inches across and has these four very angry looking spines that stick out of it. They're serrated. Um, it's a really nasty looking fruit. If you were to step on one when you're swimming, it's, it's a pretty unfriendly plant. Um, so not something we have around here, but something to watch out for. If you see a floating rosette of these triangular leaves like that, uh, not something we want to see around here. And again, we don't have any populations in Wisconsin. It's never been documented here. And we don't have any populations known from surrounding states either. So it's very much an early detection species at this point. 